On this episode of Book Reports Podcast, Sam hates audiobooks, Nazi silverware, Sam creates his own audiobook, Caviar Dreams, Mike makes Craig Rochelle cry, Bryce knows all the words to All Star by Smash Mouth, and much, much more. Champagne Wishes and Caviar Dreams, it's Book Reports Podcast. I'm Bryce Diener. And I'm Sam, first anniversary Tyler. <laughs> Sam, for our first anniversary, we kind of wanted to bring it full circle, bring it back to our very first guest. I mm. think it's more testament to our friendship that has lasted this long with him, <laughs> that he's willing to come back after what we did to him. Uh, so welcome, Michael Swigert. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm glad to be with you guys, and I'm still wondering what a caviar dream <laughs> is like. By the time you finish recording this episode, you will have no trouble imagining right, what it is. Right. We're not giving you one, but you'll know. For longtime listeners, all five of you, you'll know that in each episode we kind of asked our, our listeners what books they enjoy reading. But with our new year coming around, I want to switch it up, maybe get this new question rolling. I want to ask you what book or maybe books would you suggest to us? for future reading you kind of know our personalities now over the past few years yeah i don't know i mean like there's there's a lot of books that i've been reading i want to i want to ask you guys a question too whoa <laughs> i'd like to avoid well, answering your question yeah, yeah. and ask you one of my own <laughs> the second time he's here he just takes over the podcast <laughs> well mr two time with over a here. question um, welcome to the mike swagger podcast well, taking over we're done now <laughs> totally not totally not like, my nose is in a lot of books, but I haven't finished them, hmm. um, so I've started them. So, I mean, I could recommend the ones that I've started. <laughs> finish this for me, Bryce, please. <laughs> Tell me how it ends. I can't be but bothered. I have, in turn, attempted when listening through through audiobooks. Um, I've done that recently, and that's been a good method to where I've been able to do that. But does that count, like, if you listen yeah. to a book? I say it does. Sam does not. So, that's, yes. I, I am in the belief that if you're going to read a book... Having someone else read it to you doesn't count. Not even the author? So that they can read the inflections that they want? Unless they're reading it in person to you, even then, no. <laughs> <laughs> so when I take my microphone to Barnes & Noble for an author's reading, that doesn't count as me reading the book. <laughs> Not if you didn't write it. <laughs> there is a different set of skills that are used to listen to an audiobook than to read a book. Absolutely. I think you can get the same amount of information, much the same way if you're watching a documentary on TV. It's still not reading a book, but it's a different way of getting information. Sure, yeah, I'm on board with that. But there was one that I listened to that I think you guys would find fascinating. It was called The Like Switch, an ex-FBI agent's guide to influencing, attracting, and winning people over. I think that you guys would have fun listening to it because it's this guy who used to work for the FBI, and he now, I believe, is a professor, and he teaches this process, but he also talks talked about how he would train agents to then engage foreign assets. And what's interesting for me as a follower of Christ, he has a lot of parallels when he talks, he's talking about the like switch in regards to what it looked like for, that's the Carpenters again. Yeah, those darn cats in the alley. <laughs> Peter, Paul, and Mary. Is that the Carpenters? Or that's a Peter, Paul, that's, and Mary. That's Peter, Paul, and Mary. Mary. <laughs> Karen Carpenter and... Rainy Days and Monday. Those darn that. Bee Gees yeah, out there. Oh. Very good. <laughs> Got that hey, night fever. Gotta swing this hammer. Uh, quit that jive talking. Right. <laughs> but, How deep uh, is your nail? Yeah. Right. But, like, what he talked about is he said, like, a lot of the things he would employ to engage a foreign asset, meaning someone who they would really want to turn into a spy for the U.S., involve putting your own attention on the other person. And so it's just a fascinating parallel that, wow, he was using it for obvious... Mm -hmm. What's the best word? Politically, possibly not legal. Poli Nefarious? Political, political and like, you know, like... Um, well, he was Manipulative. Using yeah, to kind of to kind of engage someone for the benefit of the United States mm -hmm. versus to engage someone to be a friend. And through the lens of scripture, like there's a lot of this that when you let yourself go and really put the emphasis on the other person, like you can see some alignment in some of this. So that was a fascinating mm -hmm. piece. Cool. How has reading a book that tells you about body language and how it affects people around you affected how you do day to day life? 
Or has it? I'd like to think it has a little bit. Okay. But Can you nudge your way to the front of lines now easier? <laughs> like, okay, I can get in front of this guy for sure. He won't say anything. No, but it does make me think about how I posture myself to think mm-hmm. about what I'm communicating to people. If I was kind of like inching my way back towards the door, <laughs> or like we're sitting, for those of you listening, you, we're sitting around a round table and all facing the center, we're engaged in the same thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Versus if I was turned slightly to Bryce or slightly to Sam, you know, those are the types of things and and obviously it's like take it with a grain of salt you know like you can't use it as a one for one like I just thought man in a place and and role to interact with people I want to make sure I'm doing the best to interact Mm -hmm. with folks so I can know where they're at so I can help but he did share a thing that he and his buddy used to do like as a party game everyone has like personal space barrier so like Mm -hmm. three cubic feet of personal space (laughs) sure and so he and his buddy would play this game where if they were like out with a bunch of friends or something or you know hanging out with people at a party they would intentionally try to see who could by invading personal space Nudge someone to the threshold of a door. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. Like, leave the room. Yeah. So, for our anniversary, I thought it'd be kind of fun to look at our first episode. Okay. Look at the books we chose to talk about. Bryce, you yes. chose a book from your childhood, which was Holes. I did, yes. And you said that was a book that sparked your love of reading. Yeah, it did. Even though I was forced to read it by my mom, it was the match that lit the fuel, I think. Which lit and the porta potty on fire. And there's just a big Still pile blazing. of books on fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bryce has a blazing love of literacy now. <laughs> I chose in a similar vein to choose the earliest book I can remember reading and enjoying. This is The Fantastic Feats of Dr. Books by Andrew Davies. This is a book, if I recall correctly, my Aunt Mary gave to me as a gift when I was probably four. But you can tell, much like the other book I brought in from my childhood, that this is a book I've owned as a small child because almost all the illustrations are in crayon. Listeners, allow me to uh, describe a page for you here. There's a uh, Bigfoot, fully drawn in brown, beating his chest next to a Studebaker, scaring some pigs into a van. And the part with the text on it has it's been co- colored covered in, in crayon <laughs> or highlighted completely. Making it really hard to read. <laughs> I liked your NPR voice, by the way. That was good. This is All Things Considered with Terry Gross. <laughs> NPR, call me. If anyone retires, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm available. If you need a mixed bag person, I'm, I'm really mixed baggy. Yeah. All Things Jazz, call me. I love jazz. Yeah, I think if Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me ever needs to get rid of, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe their announcer, Bryce? What would you say, Bryce? From Book Reports Podcast, this is Book Reports Podcast. I'm your host, Bryce Diener, and here's your other host, Sam Tyler. Thank you, Carl. Well, this week in Book Reports Podcast, and that's about enough of that joke. <laughs> anyway. Any fan that we had listening does not listen to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and they are lost or stopped listening. They are loving it. Oh, this is so good. I've never clapped at a computer before. <laughs> yes, more. Everybody else on the bus is looking at me, but it's worth it. NPR references left and right, but mostly on the left. The far, far left. <laughs> and if you want jokes of this calendar to keep coming at you, please, please, Give us a call, make a donation, and get our lovely tote bags. Also, tickets to a Book Reports podcast recording live and call, at the and, local guy singer arena. And call your state senator. Tell them how important Book Reports podcast <laughs> is to you. <laughs> and now a portion from uh, Book Talk. So my dumb brother comes up to me and he says, My book's making a weird noise under the hood. Isn't that right, Bryce? <laughs> That's absolutely correct. <laughs> Let's drive with my brother. We're going to take a caller. <laughs> you know, when I said we should really make these shorter, I didn't realize that was impossible. <laughs> we were just going to do this anyway. Anywho. So my book this month. <laughs> I forgot you had a book. <laughs> the NPR skit, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. Yes. <laughs> my goodness. I got this book when I was four, and it is the first book I can recall reading by myself and just having fun reading it. And the reason I loved it as a kid is because it's full of animal stories. Dr. Books is... Wait, the Beach Boys? Yeah, it's full of animal (laughs) stories, because that's the name of the album, isn't it? (laughs) The little veterinarian from south of England! Dum, 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 d
What's really kind of neat about reading it as an adult is how idiosyncratic every single story is. Okay. There are certain elements that are in every single story. And for this reason, I want to go ahead and read an entire story from this book. They're all really short. They're heavily okay. illustrated, so it, it's not going to take a long time, I promise. For those who don't know, what is idiosyncratic? It's unique features that you're going to see over and over again in these specific cases. So basically, you're going to see certain plot elements that turn up in all the stories. Basically, every story has the exact same plot. Dr. Books, who is basically just something of a man-child, eccentric veterinarian, hmm. is called in to help an animal that is in some sort of trouble or the animal is where it's not supposed to be. He helps out a greyhound who is constantly falling asleep when it's running at the track. Uh, <laughs> it turns out it was staying up too late watching late night TV. <laughs> this is the plot of the story. <laughs> the very first story, he helps a giraffe with a sore throat. That's a, that's a pretty good one. He actually starts off by climbing what a What was wrong with post. it? Was it a little horse? Ah! <laughs> yes, it had eaten a horse. Uh, <laughs> It's really fun. They're very, very whimsical. They're full of child logic. Like right. the person who wrote these really thought about what makes sense to a child and what doesn't. They're okay, very, sure. they're very silly. I just want to read one story to you. Just before I read the story, I just want to say there's another story, which is, in my opinion, the turning point for this book. When uh, it gets dark. For Dr. Books as a character is the story where he Loses his license <laughs> to drinking. Yeah, <laughs> he he loses he loses a patient on the table to drinking. The the, the dog dies, and it's really sad. Why is this included? <laughs> Aunt Mary, why? <laughs> The story is uh, he finds an escaped gorilla, and he gives it a lot of cookies, and it becomes his best friend. And so for the rest of these stories, that escaped gorilla is like his John Watson. <laughs> and it's this really weird, like, well, of course the gorilla becomes his best friend. Like, naturally. But Dr. Book solves all of his problems with his knowledge of animals and his tremendous love of cookies. So just wanted to lay that out for you. He drives a red sports car, has tons of dogs, loves cookies, and has a gorilla as his best friend. So I want to read to you Dr. Book's and the Boxing Kangaroo, which is, I, I think, probably one of the best stories in this compilation. If you can get through all the highlighted text. There is going to be a part. Wow. Yes, you're looking at a page which is covered in scribbles of dark blue crayon over the part where the text is. The kangaroo at the top is nicely scribbled in brown. The rest is all dark blue. <laughs> so if I stutter a bit on that page, you'll, you'll know why. But this is Dr. Books and the Boxing Kangaroo. One morning, Dr. Books came down to breakfast, late as usual, and found to his dismay he'd completely run out of cookies. This is disastrous, he shouted. Quick, lads, into the car. He's British. The stories all take place in England, in case you were wondering. All the dogs rushed to the car, and the gorilla opened the garage doors, and they all set off for the supermarket, moaning and groaning because they were so hungry. Books parked the car outside the supermarket and got out with the dogs and the gorilla. Full speed to the cookie counter, lads, he said. But just as they got to the door, he stopped and frowned. Something peculiar was going on. There were lots of bangs and thumps and a lot of shouts and screams coming from the inside. Just then, a man came flying out the door and landed with a thump at Books' feet. What's going on? said Books. Help! Help! shouted the man and ran down the street. Hmm, said Books himself. We'd better play it crafty. Go see what's going on, Towser, he said to his cleverest dog. Towser went into the supermarket, sniffing and snuffling. There was a short pause. Then out the door flew Towser. The gorilla just managed to catch him. What happened? said Books. Row, row, oh, 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 said Towser in a frightened voice. <laughs> That's right, it says row, row, oh, oh, oh. We have exact instructions on what the dogs are saying. So if you speak dog, you can translate. Hmm, said Books. You have a lie down in the car, Towser. This smacks of kangaroo to me. <laughs> this man knows his animals. <laughs> he turned to the gorilla. Let's go, he said in a brave voice. Hand in hand, Books and the gorilla <laughs> went to the supermarket. There was nobody in sight, but there was some thumping from the direction of the meat counter. They turned the corner, and there was an enormous kangaroo in boxing gloves, bouncing up and down and throwing sausages about. <laughs> I was right, said Books. This is a boxing kangaroo from the circus. Do you think you could get him in a grip? The gorilla beat his chest a bit and then set off bravely, shuffling around the kangaroo like a wrestler. Just as he was about to spring, the kangaroo bounced up and gave him a thump on his hairy chest. Ooh, said the gorilla, sitting down and looking anxiously at Books. The kangaroo bounced up and down and got ready for another thump. Then Books had a brilliant idea. He rushed to the door and set the burglar alarm going. Just as the kangaroo heard the bell, he pricked up his ears, stopped bouncing and thumping, sat down at one of the cash desks, and fanned his snout with a plastic bag. The gorilla was amazed. Boxing kangaroo, see, said Books modestly. When he hears the bell, he thinks the fight's over. He'll be all right now. <laughs> when the manager and all the assistants came out of the cupboards they'd been hiding in. <laughs> Books, they said, you've done it again. 
Row, 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 said the dogs. Well, said Books, I'd better take him back to the circus. He took the kangaroo's paw and led him out to the car. The manager came out rushing with two barrels of cookies. Please accept these with my compliments, he said. Books was just loading them into the trunk when he heard another alarm bell. It was from the bank across the road. Three men came running out with guns and big bags of money. Bank robbers. The kangaroo bounced up and down and started thumping the sides of the car. Quick, said Books, point him in the right direction. <laughs> The gorilla pointed him at the bank robbers, and with three quick thumps, the robbers had been knocked down and the money bags were lying in the road. Ring your bell, said Books to a boy on the bicycle. The boy rang his bell, and the kangaroo sat down for rest. Then two vans drove up. One van was the police van to take the robbers away, and the other van was the circus van out looking for the kangaroo. The kangaroo looked very pleased to see his trainer again. Books and the gorilla watched him bounce into the van. He was a good kangaroo as kangaroos go, said Books thoughtfully, but to tell the truth, I'm not altogether sorry to see the back of him. <laughs> that is the quality of stories that are in these. And again, it's got the cookies that matter, it's got an animal that's in the wrong place, and it's got the gorilla doing all the heavy lifting. <laughs> It's a neat book, and I, I definitely enjoyed it as a child. And I think it is one of those books that did shape me. Hmm. Like, if you look at the contents of the stories, I do love cookies. I'm basically a gorilla, and I have you're, lots you're of You're heavyweight champion and, of the world. And I, and I box kangaroos quite frequently, and I rob banks. So I think it all it all comes together and explains who I am. I love short stories. And it kind of makes me wonder, right. is this one of the factors why? I love animals. I kind of wonder, did this come first, or did my love of animals make me hmm. love this book? I don't know. But it's one of those books that, that is so ingrained. It's just it's a part of my childhood. I'm glad I still have it, but it's just always been a part of hmm. my library. So I wonder what kind of effect it may have had on me through the years, and sure. what, what, what choices I make because of that book here's the uh, age-old book reports question mm -hmm. was there something you didn't like about dr poops probably the sections i colored over could be a little <laughs> bit easier to get through if i hadn't done that <laughs> so the only problem is younger <laughs> sam yeah i hate that guy he makes all the wrong decisions <laughs> some people if they get a time machine will go back and shoot hitler you'll go back and warn your younger self not to color yeah, the i'm just gonna take the crayons away <laughs> it's a kid's book what i honestly really enjoyed was how idiosyncratic like all the stories the cookies matter. He's out of cookies, so he goes to the store and gets cookies because he saved everybody from right. the kangaroo. The cookies matter. Like, the gorilla is his friend because he gets a call from the zoo in that story. He gets told, hey, our gorilla's missing. He's like, okay, I'm going to go look for him. He gets hungry on the way, stops at a store, and the thing he orders, they're all out of because the gorilla's eating all of them already. The gorilla is seated at a table, so he goes over, sits by him, he goes, are you a gorilla? The gorilla goes, oof. He's like, I thought so. <laughs> he then says, well, after you're done eating here, let's go eat the cookies out of my car. And he gets the emergency cookie barrel that oh he keeps word. in his trunk and feeds those cookies to the gorilla. And the gorilla loves him because of that and refuses to leave him when he takes him back to the and zoo. And the circus is just fine with that. And they're like, yeah, okay. Hey, he, he loves you. <laughs> that, that is exactly what happens. Um, that, that was my fun of it. But honestly, the answer to your question, what don't I like about this book? Yeah, just the fact that I colored over the stuff is, is the worst thing about it. It really is. It, it, it annoys me so much to look at stuff I've colored in books now. Yes, as a child, it was neat. I'm glad I did that. I'm sure it was a wonderful experience for me to color pages. But looking back now, it's really annoying that I colored over the words. Uh, it really bugs me. And it's, it's a good size, too. It's like 20, 30 pages, which is really good for... It's a 63-page book. Yeah. Oh, is it? No, oh, it hides it well. It's very slimming. <laughs> Well, it's the color. I mean, it's... Oh, yeah. Once you add the striping... Oh, so the, it's, the crayons that add 10 pounds. <laughs> yeah, they do. They really do. Well, it's, it's about a 63-page book, and the, the stories are all pretty quick. You know, we had mentioned earlier with uh, Mike that you don't like audiobooks. I do not. I think after listening to this, you've just <laughs> created an audiobook. You read a whole story from a book. So, Mike, what did you bring for us? Today? Sure. Got something good for us? Yeah, sure. I, I hope so. The book, <laughs> the book that I wanted to share with you guys it's about was one good that swagging. I read called Divine Direction, Seven Decisions That Will Change Your Life. And uh, it's written by Craig Groeschel. He's a pastor of Life Church, And it focuses on seven different words to think about how to employ them into your living. Okay. Obviously, there may be one that connects with you more than another. And at the same time, it was great to hear about the different processes through each word that he talked about. So these were the words, start, stop, stay, go, serve, connect, trust. Nice. I feel like we're just playing code words or something. Like <laughs> Banana, <Right>. chicken, <laughs> Florida. You know what to do, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast will self-destruct in about, oh, right, right. 40 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> 
So those are the, the seven words that he talks about. And he walked through what does it look like to employ those words into your life, ultimately to see how God would guide you through how you live those words out. So, so basically those seven words are basically a question then of what do I need to stop? What do I need to go and do? Who do I need to trust that? Or what do I need to trust somebody with? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So like start was kind of along the lines where... This will be a gross understatement of the book, so, you know, <laughs> Craig, if you're listening. Yeah, sorry, Craig. <laughs> Our biggest fan. Our Craig, biggest fan. He's Craig crying Rochelle. right now. <laughs> I, I was really challenged. I didn't understand it at all. I was, I was really challenged because there are pieces throughout this where it spoke to me in how I can be faithful in following Christ, how I can combat the negative influences from the quote-unquote millennial mindset, you sure. know, and really just take the next wisest step. So, for instance, like start one of the thoughts was there is probably something in front of you in your life that you know you need to do. What do you need to do to start it? So think about that one thing and find a way to start. So he talked about how oftentimes we'll want to change things and do 20 to make our life better or different. Mm-hmm. Interesting. When in reality, multitasking is a farce. Our minds cannot simultaneously handle Two things at the same time. Okay. So you're saying that when I'm driving and also nailing every single word of All Star by Smash Mouth, I am not committing myself to one hundred well, percent. There, there's a bit of muscle memory in it, but but, oh, okay. but all of your person cannot fully invest in both of those. Because I'm an All Star. They told me. Oh, hey right. now. Yeah. 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 I think it's definitely applicable to like read through or listen through like, you know, in my case where you could pick up at the piece that is the wisest and clearest to do next. Sure. Okay. Because, I mean, from the title, Seven Decisions That Will Change Your Life, obviously there needs to be one next step with only two feet. You know, we're not octopi. We have to. <laughs> we yeah. can only take o- one step. Only two time. feet. It's hard to go in As an directions. octopus, I was easily able to do all these things at once. But, but <laughs> Bryce is escaping from a jar as we speak, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but one of the one of the things that he talked about in Start was he said, you know, this whole idea of like resolutions, instead of making a bunch of resolutions, he chose to do one thing per year. One mm-hmm. new thing. One was flossing. And he shares in the book mm. how he was able to find this chain link to where if he does A, uh-huh. he gets to Z much better. And that A in a year was flossing, Interesting. committing okay. to doing that. So, and I've heard of other people that were doing that type of technique maybe month to month. I've heard of a friend who thought like maybe for a semester or something like, I want to learn French. So like, I'm just going to commit to this one thing. So that's hmm. kind of along the lines of okay. start. So, so, so you're saying we can only start one thing at a time or rather get something new one at a time. But once we've got that ingrained in us, we can then move on to something new because it's already a part of us. Right. Because okay. if, if we try to do too much or habits, all habits. at the same time, mm. we won't create a habit period. Okay. Mm. But if we choose one thing to grow in, then it's easier for that growth to take root. Okay, that's interesting. And therefore, because it's taken root, something else can grow now. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, and grow from it. Okay. Correct, yeah. And putting something into practice. Stop was, you know, there's there might be something clearly that, you know, you, you see there needs to be change in not doing anymore, you know. Stay, not flossing my teeth. Yeah, stay, <laughs> stay was focusing on how are you committing to the place and position you are currently in. See, I think that one's interesting. That's a tough one. Stay is I'm changing nothing, which, which is not necessarily an easy thing to do if there's something that you really want to not have in your life or something that mm-hmm. you are not happy to, to grapple with or to, to really accept yeah. as being a part of you, I well, guess. Well, and kind of like more so like I'm changing my mindset to commit. Oh, okay. Okay. Because so it's not I'm, I've been shot in the leg. Stay. <laughs> a fine example, Bryce. <laughs> now that's the next one. Go to the hospital. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Go to the emergency so, room. So, so stay was more like life has difficult moments. Okay. Is there a storm or a season or something that I need to weather? So it's it's an attitude thing as opposed to an action? Yeah, so having that attitude to commit to difficulty. Okay. When, when it's wise, obviously, because mm-hmm. there are some situations where it's not wise to be masochist. Masochist. masochist, yeah. Masochist, yeah. Masochist, yeah. Someone's talking well, I guess in all ways it's not wise to be a masochist, but... Some of them. Be, some yeah. of them, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was listening to the radio today. You're and, a guest in this uh, podcast. It's It's got to be in there somewhere, Mike. <laughs> I was listening to the radio today, and one guy was talking about C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Mm-hmm. He likened us to a cabin or a cottage in the book, I believe. Mm. And he said that, you know, when God moves in, he starts fixing the pipes, and he starts fixing, like, yeah. the broken floorboards and so yeah. on. We're a very happy little cottage. Right. But then he starts knocking down 
on walls. He has extensions. And that hurts the little cottage. Right. And we as people are like, why are these changes happening to me? I was so yeah. happy being a little cottage. Right. And then he said, but God wants to live in a palace. Mm-hmm. And that's what God is building us to be is a, mm-hmm. a big giant palace for him to live in. Mm-hmm. And I think that has to do with like the stay aspect, you know, yeah. the seasons that we just have to stay in those hard times of getting an extension onto our little metaphorical cottage. Or- Knock out a wall out of pergola. <laughs> <laughs> Every episode, that's what they do. <laughs> Every episode. Um, it's nice to have a nice little cottage and be a fixed up little house, but that's not what God is mm-hmm. calling us to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The stay piece was a challenging one because he shared about how in a difficult season, he was like, should I stay being a pastor? And he was mm-hmm. like, someone spoke into his life and said, you need to commit to what you're doing. Start one thing. Mm-hmm. Stop one thing. Stay here. Or go, you know, like, you know, you know what the next step is, like, take that step. So serve was, I think this was a a really clear and poignant word because it's easy for all of us, I think, as humans, I don't know, for myself, like, to think about ourselves. And so the goal of what Christ wants to do in our lives is to direct us to focus on him which in turn directs us to put our focus on others. You know, you think about love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbors yourself. Well, loving our neighbors ourself is an outcrop or a fruit of how we love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So if we find a place in which we serve, we automatically turn the focus on to someone else. Mm -hmm. Are you finding a place where you're serving? Because when you serve, like, and it's that whole deal of like, I don't know if you ever heard someone talk about Like if you're having a difficult time or you're down or something like the best way to help you get out of being down is to like go help someone else. Mm. Not that it negates or removes the difficulty, but the shift in focus is just this way that we've been designed. Find a place to serve because that puts the focus on to others, which really makes a situation and another person better. And in turn, you become Mm -hmm. better and improved in the process. So serve was the, the fifth word, connect. That one weaves, I think, through the other words a bit where it's like connect with others. Mm -hmm. Book Reports podcast is what it is because of your great friendship together. You know what I mean? Like, it's the anniversary (laughs) episode, guys. That is true. It's not untrue, I suppose. (laughs) And and the massive amounts of money I pay him to do this. This is is the anniversary (laughs) episode. It's okay if we get a little sappy. But but the idea... I'm your trophy podcast host. (laughs) The idea of... I was just reading about this today. The idea of, like, life is not biodome. Meaning... The Pauly Shore yeah, that, that, movie? That was what well, it, no, like the but, actual uh, thing. The? Like the actual thing. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay, the actual biodome. Like when okay. they built the actual biodome. Right. Like in the desert to create right. this utopian environment where mm-hmm. everything was present except for wind. There needs to be connection <laughs> beyond ourselves. And so are we connecting rather than living our life as like a personal biodome thinking thinking that i can be self sufficient right. that i can have everything that i need without being connected i mean ultimately to god and then to others you know so right. i don't remember what, what was biodome a failure i can't yep, remember i feel like it was and yeah. then they made a second one which also failed i believe i don't remember why i just remember having a vague feeling like it i was failed. reading about like how there wasn't wind in biodome and okay. so randomly after trees grew they mm-hmm. would just topple over that's interesting. Because their root system wasn't deep. The article I was reading was saying that had there been wind, uh-huh. the trees would have naturally been challenged for their roots to right. go deeper. He talked about the word trust. And, I mean, ultimately, for a follower of Christ, are you trusting God with your life? Is there one that sticks out to you the most that you like for yourself the most? A word? Out of those seven. Out of those words? Yeah. I mean, I think listening through it, the things that stuck out to me is I've, I've heard it before that anytime we stop something, we are by nature going to replace that with something. Meaning if we leave here without plans, something's going to happen. Right. I don't know what, but something's going to happen. But things... That sounded oddly threatening, right? I don't know what's going to happen to you, but something. No, it Just wasn't meant to be not, 40s mobster. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. Can I, it, it was can I give a, like, a funny story sure, there sure. That, I just, that popped in my head right. of just something happening? Before my brother and I were born, my dad, newly married to my mom, hops in the truck with my grandfather. I think they went to like go pick up coal or something like that for like a okay. coal stove. They take a wrong turn on the street, my grandfather's driving, and they end up in the middle of a parade. <laughs> 
<laughs> so how great is that? He didn't make the plan of how to get home properly. And so, like, there's a, like, a, a float in front of him who's very angry that there's now a random car. My they, dad is... They start handing out coal to the kids on the street corner. <laughs> My dad, like, sinks down on... Like, it's one of those bench seats, so he sinks down as far oh. as possible. He's so embarrassed. My grandfather just starts just laughing waving. and waving. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, in the street parade called life, you can either slink down into the, the seat or you can start waving at people. That's what my fortune That's, cookie tells me. Yeah. Yeah. The words that stuck out to me were like the, the stop and start because anytime you take something out, that space will be replaced with something. Oh, yeah. yeah. So am I making the conscious decision to stop an unwise thing or a wrong thing? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like search my heart and then start a new healthy thing. So those those are two that stuck out to me. I oh, mean, yeah. no, no matter what you're doing, there's always the same number of hours in the day. Uh, right. If you stop doing something else, you're going to end up doing something different. Uh, mm-hmm. So no matter what. Yeah. It is. So it spoke to to the realm of like prioritization and mm-hmm. uh, you know kind of making sure that that happens in an appropriate way. Did you notice a difference maybe? In that this was an audio book. I think you're the first of hopefully many audio books. Our that first will... guest who is willing to admit that they listened to an audio book <laughs> instead of an actual book. didn't have book. a physical copy to yeah. bring. Right. Um, <laughs> did you did you think that somehow maybe Fortunately, added the to... Gall. I'll be glad to read the transcript of the Book Reports <laughs> podcast if you, if you distribute it. Our friendship will continue if that happens. That's um, fine. <laughs> did you think that added to what you got out of the book or maybe took something away from it? Being that it was an audio book. I don't know. It was it was a different format, and this was that was the first audio book that I had went Listen through. To? I was really? gonna, well, I was, was going to say that would be kind of redundant. That was the first audio book that I listened to. <laughs> but um, I just want to be done. I only read the back cover. <laughs> didn't listen to it. I don't want to be redundant. I just want to be dundant. I didn't listen to it. I just tasted it. Just um, sat there licking CDs. It was the first one. They asked me to leave the library. <laughs> It was, it was the first one that I had listened to, and I found the format engaged mm-hmm. my mind in a different way. Okay. I mean, obviously, like you said, Sam, earlier, like to put your eyes to the page and underline or highlight or jot a note in the margin is different than when you hear things mm-hmm. in an auditory nature. You also are getting a different source of information in sure. the person's voice and their inflection. That's yeah. going to change how you interpret things. Too. Well, right. And so, no, that book was not read by the author. So some of them have been. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that adds a, even a different nuance to know like, oh man, this is the author that's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. speaking these words. But I did find myself, there are times where I'd be going along and I'd be like, oh, I need to hear that again. So I would hit reverse 30 seconds and listen hmm. to it again just to kind of catch it. That's a fun sure. feature. Yeah. So, well, and you can also like say It's called rewind. <laughs> <laughs> Marvel of technology. <laughs> there's another term. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, there's a nice feature too. Like you can save clips. Oh, so cool. you have like a library of clips that you save. That's interesting. I was going to say, because it's hard to go back right, to. Right. Where did I highlight? What did exactly. I highlight? What did I that's like? a, that's so a I've started doing it. And you, I think. Yeah. I think I'm still new to it, but I think you can put like titles to the clip if you want to jot a note. That's interesting. You can jot a note. That's that weird is. story about turtles. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> is the, but what do you do with the clip? Like, is is this your copy of the audiobook, or were you mm-hmm. renting it from Audible? Or? Nope. Uh, you can you can keep it on the cloud, or you can download it to your device. Okay. So having those notes does function and after then you finish reading it. And it's linked to the it. account. Yeah. Oh, that's so. clever. I like that. That's yeah. a good feature. So it's a nice feature. Thanks for coming back for the second time. Yeah, I exactly. appreciate you guys having me here for the show. Thank I'm you. Excited for you guys in your first full year of podcasting, and to you that are listening, I hope you have as much fun listening to Sam and Bryce as I do spending time with them. Stick around because there's great content to come in April. So the book that I chose for this episode is Band of Brothers by Stephen E. Ambrose. This has been turned into a very famous miniseries by HBO. It's so famous, even I saw it. That's right. Which I will say, I've seen the series so many times. When I see the actors in other shows, I'm yeah. like, oh, yeah, you you play that guy. <laughs> Jimmy Fallon. Yeah, I was going to say, this is, cameo. is Jimmy Fallon one of those so people? So every night, I'm like, hey, wasn't that guy in the... Wait a second. He's not delivering ammunition. <laughs> what, what's, 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 he, that guy? what's he hiding? Yeah. What's he doing with the roots? I thought he died. <laughs> <laughs> My college roommates have now cut out listening because they hate that I watched Band of Brothers so many times in college that they're just sick of it. <laughs> I had the DVD series, and we had a giant projector that we projected oh onto the wall, like a TV. And so they would just come back from class late at night and just see me watching Band of Brothers <laughs> for the 10th time this month. <laughs> so what the story entails, this this book follows the E-Company, or Easy Company, of a paratroop division in World War II. These were actually real guys 
A lot of these guys are drafted. A lot of the guys volunteer to join the army. And as they're going through being introduced into the army right before basic training, they say, hey, for an extra $50 a month, you can volunteer to become a paratrooper. That's good money. I actually did the math on it. It's actually $300 in today's money. Oh. And so for $300 extra, you can join this new, never before done group. So I was going to ask, how new was paratrooping? Because well, they were the 101st doing it, so there's got to be 100 <laughs> more before them. Well, that's the trick. That It makes you sound like there's more groups. <laughs> <laughs> but like, like how, how new was the idea of a paratroop? I mean, it was not in World War One. So World War II was the first war to introduce paratroopers. The idea is that you fly over the enemy line, come and land on the other side of the enemy line, and you can take out barracks or strategic points, so that way when the enemy is retreating, there's no way for them to really one, escape to a safe location, and also they're already surrounded because your army is now advancing on the beachhead. Mm -hmm. But it's very dangerous because now you are behind enemy lines. It's dangerous for another reason before you land as well. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Because the enemy does see you and you're just a floating target falling Mm -hmm. down. And so these guys are in the United States. They say, hey, for an extra 50 bucks, you can become a paratrooper. And so Easy Company is what this book is focused on. Their leader at the time was a man named Captain Sobel. And he was a very strict individual. He made them exercise more than any other company. He made them become the very best of any company. When everyone else got to go to lunch or go to sleep, he was like, okay, let's do some more drills. And so they all hated him because he's making them do extra work. But what it actually did was create camaraderie amongst the enlisted men and the officers that because we all hate this guy, (laughs) we're all joining together as a band of brothers. Right. I know you were about to ask this. Bryce, where does the name Band of Brothers come from? Yeah, Bryce... Where does the name Band of Brothers come from? Well, it turns out a lot of them were in the same band, and they were brothers. Oh, good. (laughs) It comes from Henry V's speech of Crispin Day. From this day to the very end of the world, we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we Band of Brothers. And so Henry V is giving that rousing speech to his men, and so it, it fits very well with these Easy Company guys, and that's kind of where they get the name, or Stephen Ambrose got the name for Band of Brothers. Mm -hmm. There are a few excerpts, rather, I'd like to include here. A few selections from the book. There you go. Yeah. Bryce, please don't make this a long thing. Don't read an entire story, okay? That would just really... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'll do my best. <laughs> um, Captain Sobel, I already mentioned him. There was another man named Richard Winters, and he was kind of the second in charge under Captain Sobel. He's like the polar opposite. Everyone likes him. Right. Everyone thinks, hey, he's a smart fella. I would follow this guy into battle. And so I just want to introduce him because we're going to mention him later. So there's paratroopers that have gone through basic training with Captain Sobel. Now they've all passed basic training, and so now they're going to paratroop school. This is at a different location. These sergeants who are in charge of stages A, B, C, and D of training have to get them through each stage. Once you finish A stage, you go to B stage, so on and so forth. So the first guy... What comes after B stage? I forget. And so paratroop school was supposed to begin with physical training, A stage, followed by B stage, C stage, oh, there we go. Oh, hey, how about that? And D stages, each lasting a week, but the 506 skipped A stage. This happened because the first battalion arrived ahead of the others, went into A stage, and embarrassed the jump school sergeants (laughs) who were assigned to lead the calisthenics and runs. The Tacoa, so Tacoa is a uh, uh, the area that they trained, and like a mountain was Kurahi. They had to climb up three miles up, three miles down. Tacoa graduates would laugh at the sergeants on the runs. They would begin running backwards, challenging the sergeants to a race. Ask them after a couple hours of exercise that left the sergeants panting uh-huh. when they were going to get past the warm up and into the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> after two days, after two days of such abuse, the sergeants told the commanding officer that the 506 was in much better physical condition than they were. So all the companies of the 506 started immediately on B stage. <laughs> that gives you some idea of the kind of physical uh-huh. capacity these guys were able to muster. And right. that even though they didn't like Captain Sobel, he made them the best unit in the U.S. Army and right. probably the entire U.S. military forces. Having seen the show, it's hard for me not to just make me compare it, whatever you talk about, to compare it to the show. Sure. Sobel is portrayed pretty much as just a flat jerk with no real redemption yeah. in the series. And you're saying that there is some good to it. How does that yeah. – w- w- was your experience – Sorry, I don't have a question. Uh, I'm <laughs> well, just, here, let me, I'm just talking to let, hear myself Let talk. me see if I can answer your question because I was going to mention this. I noticed a remarkable difference between Dick Winters in the book and Dick Winters in the show because – in the show, he almost becomes like this innocent saint. Yeah. Like, oh, hey, I don't know why people like me so much. It must be because I'm a cool guy. Yeah. Whereas in the book, you can definitely tell, like, I mean, he is doing his best. He's all that stuff. 
but he can definitely tell that he doesn't like Captain Sobel, uh-huh. the guys don't like Captain Sobel, and he even agrees Captain Sobel shouldn't be here, he shouldn't be in charge of these people, I should be leading these guys. Oh, uh, all okay. This stuff. So he, he, he definitely seems, I guess you'd say, not polished. Mm-hmm. Did this book change your opinion of the series at all? It definitely adds a lot more to the show. I think Stephen Ambrose did a fantastic job. I'm just going to answer the question now. There's not something I didn't like about the book. I, okay. I need to start reading books. I can find stuff I don't like. Because <laughs> every week, every episode is like, no, I didn't like it. I, uh, I loved it. I loved every bit of it. But Stephen Ambrose is such a brilliant writer. Uh-huh. I have a book that he wrote about Lewis and Clark. I think I'll have to read in a future episode because I never read too much about them. So I think that'll be a good control group to see how well of an individual oh, Stephen Ambrose. because you don't care about the subject matter. Exactly. So That is the big thing about nonfiction is you're more apt to read a badly written nonfiction book because the topic already interests right. you. Right. I think in a future episode I'll read that book about Lewis and Clark with Stephen that's a, Ambrose. That's a good idea. Just to see how well an author is. Because I definitely went in biased because I watched the show beforehand and then I got the book and then I continued to watch the show. Well, and, and let's face it, it's a book on World War II. I mean, that's exactly. something you and I are both a sucker for. Exactly. I mean, yeah. Of all the atrocities, I think my favorite... <laughs> World War II. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> because this is a book, you can yeah. pack a lot more background detail in mm-hmm. than you can, obviously, in a televised miniseries. Is there any facts in the book that really change your perspective on the stuff portrayed in the miniseries or things that just surprised you or things that really just kind of stuck out to you as being really vastly different or, or more enlightening than what's in the miniseries? In the miniseries, before ap- episode starts and at the very end, usually mm-hmm. they'll have interviews. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with the actual the, guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's hard to think of these sweet, innocent old men as being like these rough and rugged guys who are actually killing people. Yeah, who who were tough enough to win World War Two? Exactly. I can definitely see them as like be, being tough guys, but it's like I've maybe built them up as heroes in my mind. And so the problem is to think that these heroes did those nasty things, like actually killing people, like popping out shots. Like one of the first things that they did on D Day as they jump in, Captain or I believe it's Captain Winters at this point. Yeah, I did say that. So we'll stick with that. Um, the now I, Captain Winters. I, I keep giving him promotions. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant General. <laughs> Doctor <laughs> Commander. Winters. President Winters. <laughs> Admiral, somehow in the Navy. At this point, Captain Sobel has been relieved of duty. Okay. He is now in charge of a parachute training camp back in England. They're given a new commanding officer whose plane actually goes down on D-Day, but Captain Winters doesn't know that yet. So right now, Captain Winters is the adjunct leader of Easy Company. And what Colonel Singh, who's in charge of their battalion, says is there's these cannons that are firing on Utah Beach. You guys need to take Easy Company, take them out. And so the way that he takes out all three cannon is actually still textbook today. And if you go to like military school or if you join the army and you are like sitting in class, they will still teach you about this event. These guys were so good at their jobs that they created textbook examples of how to take out positions that have more troops in a defensive position. Mm -hmm. Uh, Here's a photo just because Easy Company had a well reputation of being the best. Mm-hmm. Here's a photo of Dwight Eisenhower and Winston Churchill inspecting, <laughs> inspecting the troops. Someday all of you are going to be represented in an HBO miniseries, I guarantee it. <laughs> really good Eisenhower? And I'll be played by John Lithgow. <laughs> Someday I should be so lucky. <laughs> okay, for this excerpt, I'm skipping to the very end of the war. They've done very well. <laughs> The, Just to give you an idea, they were at like the front lines of the Battle of the Bulge. Were in Bastogne. They were in Bastogne. That's what they I were thought, in yeah. Bastogne before that. These guys are just used to being behind enemy lines, surrounded. And so they're always at the front lines. And what happens is they get into Bavaria. Okay. They're in Germany. There is this like mountain escape that is called Berchtesgaden. Berchtesgaden. Berchtesgaden was this town of like, if you're a Nazi and a true Nazi, you better have a house in this town. Well, it was their, like, little summer getaway kind of town. Yeah, exactly. And so if you were anybody in the Nazi party, you had a chateau at this place. And on the highest peak of the mountain, like several thousand feet in the air, there was what's called the Eagle's Nest. And it was like a little outlook that Hitler could go up to. There was a gold-leafed inlaid elevator that was able to take you to the top. And what they said is that Hitler was actually afraid of heights, so he didn't really go there very Aww. often. Huh. Oh, you don't have to awe Hitler. No, I think I, you're fine. No, I'm saying the waste of gold in the elevator then. Oh, like, yeah. What? And, and the eagle's nest. Like, and so what happens is the Italians know about this place. They're all looting for souvenirs. The French, who are right there on the front lines, several miles away, want to get to Birch's Garden because all these Nazi souvenirs are probably there. Right. Nazi souvenir, but also, in the intelligence gathering, I would have to imagine, would be doubly important. Yeah, all that stuff, too. At this point, he's a major, so Major Winters is told by Colonel Strayer to rout the French. 
to get in front of them so that the French cannot take Berchtesgaden. Right. At this point, the roads are blocked by all these rocks, blown out bridges. Hitler said, this needs to be our last stand uh, where the SS needs to take their last stand. They didn't listen to Hitler. At this point, he had been dead already, and so they're just afraid for their lives at this well, point. Yeah, there was a huge plan in place. Uh, the werewolf movement and so on was, was yeah. a big part of uh, like what to do. After. What could happen in post-war Germany. Yeah, and so Easy Company ends up taking it. They're getting ready for like this final last stand of like the toughest soldiers in the Nazi mm. part, because the SS was like the worst of the worst, and it's a ghost town. Everybody's left. All they're meeting are maidservants and manservants who are still walking around and, like, setting up dinner plates and everything. Suspiciously tall and buff-looking maids with scars on their faces who who step in time (laughs) a lot. And and look like they've just shaved off a short mustache. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes. (laughs) Let me go dust the furniture, (laughs) mine commander. (laughs) I'm just about to move the vases. (laughs) We have no towels. Let me beat the carpets. <laughs> yes. Enjoy your stay. <laughs> hmm. Something's not right. Easy Company gets there, and it's just a free for all of all this stuff. Richard Winters enters this big dining room where they can see the back of one of the manservants leaving because he's like scrambling because the soldiers are just walking in, and he walks over to this four foot long velvet lined case that he was just working in, and it's all this fine china and silverware. <laughs> Knives and forks and everything, uh-huh. and he just starts loading up his helmet. And, all this stuff. and they said that they're still using that silverware today, <laughs> over forty years later. Uh, so it's good quality silverware. Yeah. So they're just raiding this whole Burgess Garden. They find that there's a whole group of cars that have just been left behind. Like Hitler's personal car mm. was there. So the guys are just loving just driving these around. One guy had a fire truck with like the <laughs> lights and bells, and he's just driving around town. <laughs> With the bells on lights going and everything like that. One guy um, found Hitler's ice cream car. <laughs> yeah. As more and more higher ups come in the town throughout the coming weeks, they, they want to ride the fire truck. Exactly. They start really. Com- they start commandeering and pulling rank and saying, "Hey, I don't want you to have this really nice car. I mm-hmm. need to drive around." And so the guys are like, "Hmm, how can we ruin this and have a bit more fun one last time before giving it over?" Sergeant Talbert was one of these guys. Before Talbert turned over his Mercedes, he was able to report to Major Winters that the windows were bulletproof. (laughs) This is Hitler's Mercedes, by the way. (laughs) That the windows were bulletproof, but if he used armor-piercing ammo, it would get the job done. Winters thanked him for his research, agreed that no one knew when this kind of information would come in handy. The men tried another experiment. They drained the water out of the radiator of the Mercedes to see if it could run without it. Later, we find out that Mercedes couldn't even make it up halfway to the Eagle's Nest because it just died on them. With a third luxury car, they decided that before turning it in, they would see if it could survive a 30-meter crash. So they pushed it over a cliff. (laughs) Valuable data. Good job, gentlemen. There is one last here I will end with. This was way back at the very end of D-Day. Before lying down, Winters later wrote in his diary, I did not forget to get on my knees and thank God for helping me live through this day and asked for his help on D plus one. So D day plus one. Right. And he made a promise to himself. If he lived through the war, he was going to find an isolated farm somewhere and spend the remainder of his life in peace and quiet. He actually kept that promise to himself after the war. Uh, when Korea came around in the 50s, he helped paratroopers train, but he didn't want to actually jump. Mm. And so after helping the paratroopers train in Korea, he moved to Hershey, Pennsylvania, near where we are, recording live right now. Uh, Outside the chocolate factory. <laughs> We're the guys in the Reese's we- Peanut Butter and Hershey Bar suits. <laughs> we are... <laughs> Be sure to come and say hi to us. Walk up to them and ask them about Book Reports Podcast. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> they will love you. <laughs> and so he actually moved to Hershey, Pennsylvania, and became a farmer. And actually, a nice little connection I have to Richard Winters personally. My uncle worked at a store and sold him seed. Please, Bryce, there is no more personal connection. Oh, but wait. Possibly there, have. There's one. Than your uncle selling him seed. <laughs> <laughs> what could top that story? <laughs> Richard Winters ends up getting married to a lovely lady. I'm sure I haven't met her. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe she was a jerk. Who knows? They end up having a daughter. She grows up. And my father invited her to prom. And that's my little connection is my dad took Dick Winters' daughter to prom. They have a good time? I don't know. Apparently not. I didn't didn't ask her. (laughs) Yeah, apparently it didn't work out. Otherwise, I would be saying Grandpa Winters. (laughs)
thanks a lot for listening to our first anniversary episode of Bookport's podcast. Hope you've enjoyed the last 12 episodes. And if you hadn't, why are you listening to this one? <laughs> why uh, did you start at episode 12? <laughs> <laughs> well, don't start with episode one, to be no, fair. That's, that. that's yeah. So this is actually a better episode one than episode one is. But- I'd like to thank our guest, Mike, for coming on the show. Thanks a lot for being with us, Mike. We know you had to leave early and go take care of some, some family stuff. So thanks very much for joining us for our anniversary episode. Thanks very much for being our guest, Mike. You were terrific. If you enjoyed this episode and you want to hear it all over again, because we were that good, or listen to the ones that came before it, uh, you can find all our episodes on iTunes, most of them on SoundCloud. Uh, you can find the links on Facebook, and you can also find us on YouTube now. So feel free to like us and rate and review us in whatever format you're listening to us. We'd appreciate that. It helps people find the show. You can also talk to us directly if you want to communicate with us, ask us a question, maybe tell us a book you want us to talk about, whatever it is, by sending us an email at bookreportspodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can come find me, punk, at uh, my blog. <laughs> Got adversarial there. <laughs> you can come find me and see my game writing for role-playing games at skullduggeringthesmoke.blogspot.com. Still working on Constantinople. We'll be doing so for quite a while. Our show music, as always, is by Kevin McLeod. More of his music at incomputech.com. Thanks a lot for the music. It's really wonderful. I'm Bryce Diener. And I'm Sam Tyler. Thanks very much for listening, and we wish you a happy anniversary to, to us. <laughs> oh, I'm on fire tonight. My goodness. You can just, just cut it at my There's, laugh. They're, oh, just cut it at my laugh. What am I doing? Okay. So that, that'll do it. Let's, let's end there before it gets worse. I was at the grocery store. <laughs> what? In honor of your, in honor of your anniversary Spork- episode. <laughs> Sparkling <laughs> cider. I <laughs> cider. Thank, Thank you so much, Mike. Hold on. Hold on, you know how to open those, right? There's a, there's a metal cage you have to take off. Well, oh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, just a, what's <laughs> happening out there? Is there a surprise party for our anniversary out there, Mike? You're going to lead in like eight people in a banner and confetti and... Cheers. Cheers.